thanks for uh, logging in. This is um, the first of a series of events that are hosted by the Posthumanism Research Institute uh, at Brock University. Um, our next event is a roundtable titled Explorations in Empirical Posthumanism with a number of speakers, and that will take place on October 29th. And it will be followed by a talk by Emily Jones uh, on posthuman international law and the rights of nature, and that will take place on November 17th. Um, details are available on our website at brocku.ca slash PRI. And today we are very happy to host a talk by Dr. Rick Dolphin from uh, Utrecht University. Uh, I want to thank the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies for providing the web hosting and also for lending us one of their interns, Anita Metza, to look after any Zoom difficulties we may encounter. Anita will also help me monitor the chat for questions. Um, we ask that you indicate your desire to ask a question or make a comment. Um, with your name in the chat, or even type your question there uh, if for some reason you cannot use your microphone. Um, we are recording the talk, um, but not the question period. Um, in, so there won't be any issue of uh, privacy or confidentiality for you. Um, just want to pass the microphone to Mitch uh, for an announcement regarding Experience BU in case it applies to any of our attendees. Mitch? Hi, uh, yes, if we have any Brock students who are participating as part of the uh, BU program, um, specifically the campus-wide co-curriculum, and you want credit for your attendance here, um, please just send me a private message in the chat. You can select, um, in the chat, you can select everyone or you can select a single participant. So you select me and send me your email address or email me, my email address is on the flyer of the event. Email me with your email address, letting me know that you would like credit, and then I will forward that along to the BU office. So you'll get credit for your attendance. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Um, so now today um, we are hosting um, Rick's talk, which is titled, The Wounds That Matter. Um, which is a discussion related to uh, his most recent book, The Philosophy of Matter, um, a meditation, which I finished reading an hour ago. Um, it was um, a really inspiring reading and, and a group of us are, are reading it and discussing it uh, here at the Helsinki Collegium. Um, so we're pretty excited to, um, to listen to, um, to the talk. Um, Dr. Dolphin is an associate professor at Media and Culture Studies at Utrecht University, and he's an honorary professor at the University of Hong Kong. Um, he published widely on new materialism, posthumanism, and affect theory. His monograph that I sh just showed to you was published um, by Bloomsbury, and it just came out like this is fresh out of, hot out of the press, as they say, um, last month. Um, and um, another book that I also recommend highly, um, along with this one, um, is the, the one that he co-authored with Iris van der Twin um, in 2012, The New Materialism, Interviews and Cartographies, which I also found, found um, really inspiring. So um, without further ado, I will uh, pass the microphone to Rick and also um, ask you to share your screen for your presentation. Thank you, Rick. I think you're muted still, Rick. Yeah, does it work? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you, Christine, and thank you also, uh, Institute, uh, Pochum Research Institute, for having me and for um, um, inviting me for this talk. Uh, I will discuss um, the book that I just published, but not so much in entirety, of course, uh, but focusing a bit on the concept, which I think is really um, 
uh, what was very important for me and for uh, at least a large part of the book, which is called, uh, which is the wound, the idea of woundedness. And I will say something more about that. Uh, I will just discuss the different parts of the book and then focus some more on, on woundedness. And then after that, in the discussion, we'll see if it also is important for you or if you can do something with it. Uh, we'll find out. Um, so, yeah, this is the book. The, the cover is done by Oscar Chan, a uh, very good artist from Hong Kong. Uh, I was really happy that he was willing to do that, which kind of summarizes the whole book, which I'm really pleased with. He actually read it, so that's good. Um, yeah, let me start. Oh, that's the wrong button. Um, how can I go to the next? Ah, here. Okay, so as said, as, as Christine already announced, I have a background in um, what can be called continental philosophy and art theory, which means that uh, I write a lot about uh, writers such as uh, Gilles Deleuze and Michel Serres and about French feminism. Uh, and um, that amounts to kind of teaming up with what is nowadays called uh, post-humanism or new materialism, so sometimes affect studies. And for a book like this, uh, which I very ambitiously called The Philosophy of Matter, uh, I found out that there was no book called The Philosophy of Matter. So I thought uh, there are so many books called The Philosophy of Mind, but none was called The Philosophy of Matter. So I thought there was an opportunity uh, because I was writing about this issue for such a long time already. Uh, so I thought to start a book on the philosophy of matter, I have to uh, kind of um, make sure that this connection with um, uh, materialist thinking, with post-humanist thinking is being made in the beginning. Uh, of course, this is also way too much to discuss. Uh, the book itself is actually not that big. So... Uh, I cannot uh, kind of summarize uh, the, the whole philosophy of matter. This is why I was also uh, keen on using the, the term uh, a meditation, which gives me the freedom to kind of speak about it more freely and to uh, not feel obliged to, to include a whole history. But I do think the starting point is very important. Um, uh, I come from the Netherlands and I'm familiar with Dutch history, of course. Um, and I'm also familiar with Dutch writers, so that's why for me it was easiest to start with a um, very interesting part of Dutch history, uh, which is in the 17th century when the Netherlands were doing very well on many different levels. Um, it was also a very liberal state at that time. Uh, it was so liberal that it di didn't even have a capital. People think it was Amsterdam, but Amsterdam was not the capital. Uh, but anyway, um, especially in philosophy, uh, for, for myself, very important, there was an interesting opposition um, to be found. Uh, René Descartes, a uh, Frenchman, was living in Amsterdam, uh, tried to get a job at the new universities here that were starting here in the Netherlands, actually. Uh, which didn't succeed because he was way too, uh, too, too, too uh, revolutionary for his days. Uh, but he was getting more and more popular. His thinking was getting more popular. And of course, uh, the Cartesian thinking, the thinking of René Descartes, in the end became extremely influential in Europe and after that also in the rest of the world. Um, the start of modernism, uh, René Descartes, uh, and then after that, Immanuel Kant. Those are the two figures that really kind of uh, uh, renewed philosophy in that sense. Next to René Descartes, however, there was also uh, Baruch de Spinoza, um, a Jewish immigrant. Uh, he didn't speak any Dutch, by the way, uh, but he uh, lived in Amsterdam, um, part of the Jewish community. And he started um, his career by first uh, giving a comment on Descartes, but then writing very revolutionary stuff, which was actually so uh, much 
against the established powers that he was unable to publish it during his life. He was smart enough not to do that. Uh, he saw that in many other European, and uh, we're talking about 1677, he saw that in many other European uh, cities, uh, philosophers who were more open about their ideas were getting into big trouble. Giordano Bruno was just put uh, on fire in Rome. So uh, that was a wise decision not to publish this during his life. Content-wise, we see a big difference with um, Descartes and Spinoza. And I try to summarize it in this uh, uh, slide. Uh, Descartes um, can be considered a humanist. Uh, so very much thinks that we, we know the phrase, I think, therefore I am, uh, which says that any kind of thinking starts and actually originates in the human mind. So that's Descartes. Uh, um, um, and that has been enormously influential. Um, Antonio Negri calls it uh, the, 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 the book for the bourgeois of Europe because everyone who had a bit of power uh, used Descartes also to kind of gain some momentum or to uh, say that here I am and this is what I can do and we uh, I'm an indiv individual rationalist thinker so I can come up for myself um, and I called this um, in the first part of my book uh, um, and I, I, I refer to Cartesian thinking as light and selective because it's very much kind of focusing on individuality uh, on uh, on rationality, of course, and on, in the end, dominating um, uh, thinking. Uh, so the the way in which uh, the sciences were organized, the way in which uh, the thinking about human presence was organized, and the thinking about the economy was organized. So Cartesian thinking has had an enormous influence um, throughout Europe, and that's why I also. Uh, call it the present because it has such a power um, on so many different uh, uh, in so many different fields of thought that it really I mean it organized our society Cartesian thinking uh, or what has later become modernist thought. Spinoza on the other hand was always considered very um, difficult and uh, especially those in power were never very fond of uh, Spinoza's thinking. Um, I think that we are, and we, I mean, uh, the people who are interested in post-humanist thinking and new materialist thinking and affect theory. And why is that? Because he doesn't start with the human being. He starts with uh, what we can now call the more than human world. So he doesn't think that the human being is an exception in many ways. Uh, he tries to understand how, how the human being functions and how human thinking works, um, but he does that by creating connections and by not so much selecting the human being. That's why I call it dark instead of the light, of course, because it's very much about searching for new relationships, searching for new relationships. And I like the term contemporary because it uh, plays with the idea that it happens with the times. I say that Spinoza's thinking um, has not been dominant like Cartesian thinking, but it has always been there under the surface. I also call it the undercurrent for that reason. Um, it has been at work um, for in many different ways, and it had an enormous influence on uh, important thinkers uh, like Leibniz and like Einstein and like many uh, that would follow, but not as obvious and not as, as well, and not as clear as Descartes. Uh, Descartes was always a very obvious point of reference to those interested in individuality and in rational thought, whereas Spinoza was much more well, also difficult to grasp in that sense. So I, as the title of this um, first part, I use the term imagining the undercurrent uh, because I say that this Spinoza is thinking, actually not only with Spinoza, but I said this was really kind of my way of, of um, 
of positioning two different ways of thinking, the Cartesian thinking and the Spinozist thinking. And Spinozist thinking has been there all along as a kind of an undercurrent, uh, but it has been less visible. I would say that it is becoming more visible nowadays. I use the term imagining because if you read Spinoza carefully, he's not so much interested in rational thought, although he used the term a lot, it was a very popular term in his days. Uh, he says the first kind of thinking, he distinguishes different kinds of thinking. The first kind of thinking in Spinoza is the imagination. And imagination is very interesting uh, and very important for me in the end, because I think that uh, imagination allows us to um, make mistakes. Uh, it is the first kind of thinking. It is very kind of direct and raw and um, connected to creativity. And that is why also in Spinoza, you see that um, Spinoza actually warns us very often for uh, imagination because we can make a lot of mistakes. But at the same time, it's also how we will always <clears throat> start to rethink things. And uh, I think especially philosophy and the arts are the fields where imagination is of such of such an importance that that we should kind of reevaluate the importance of um, uh, of this first kind of thinking in Spinozist uh, thought. <clears throat> I think it would help us a lot also to move away from the Descartes from the Cartesian rationalist modernist thinking. So reevaluation re of of imagination would be uh, kind of uh, important for 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 what I would call the philosophy of matter. I'm trying to understand Zoom. Yeah. So thinking is not about rational thought, but about the raw and untamed imagination that precedes it. Here, the philosopher and the artist do the same thing. Practicing the thinker, producing the artist, only asks for another way of perceiving. Imagine otherwise, this is then the kind of uh, the message. So that was more or less what I, uh, what I start with. Yeah. Important, uh, of course, in understanding uh, the notion of matter, which is, well, as the title already says, extremely important for, for what I tend to do here, is how Spinoza rethinks the notion of matter. So in Descartes, there's an obvious opposition between mind and matter. The connection between the two is extremely vague, um, which is why so many uh, philosophers, especially in the in the in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, focus on the philosophy of mind and have a problem with the whole notion of matter. Actually, uh, in Spinoza's thinking, uh, matter becomes really important, and that is why those who follow Spinoza, for instance, also Karl Marx, uh, uh, have a have a need to have feel a very an urgent need to rethink the notion of matter or materialism. That's why. Marxist thinking is often referred to as historical materialism. I won't go into detail kind of the way in which historical historical materialism differs from new materialism, but and different kinds of materialism, different ways of interpreting Spinoza, I would say. So for Spinoza, the notion of matter is really important. And I kind of summarize this always in two ways. Uh, which I think is uh, why Spinoza was extremely revolutionary in his days. Uh, first of all, when Spinoza talks of the individual, and it is not, uh, not only the individual as uh, kind of the human individual, but any kind of individuality, Spinoza would say that an individual is always a series of individuals ad infinitum. So that's actually one of the propositions in his uh, book, The Ethics. An individual is always a series of individuals at infinitum. Second point, every individual is always a body and a mind. So there are two ways in which every kind, every individuality expresses itself. First, in a bodily way. Second, 
in a in terms of a mind. Spinoza says there can actually be many more ways of expressing the body, but we human beings are limited and we only know bodies and minds. Uh, so that's it, we have to deal with it. Every individual is always a body and a mind. And now comes the, the magic formula uh, of Spinozism, where the mind is an idea of the body, while the body is the object of the mind. Uh, yeah, this this needs at least some explanation because this, this is quite uh, tricky. The mind is an idea of the body. So for Spinoza, any form of thinking, any idea always comes to us through the body. And again, the body is then not just the human body. It can be any kind of body. So for people like um, Jeffrey Bateson, for instance, 1970s, uh, talks a, a lot about the interaction between the human and the computer in cybernetics. Uh, the body would then be the connection between the human and the computer. So what thinks is then not so much the human body, but would be the connection between the human and the computer. And that's what thinks. Uh, Bateson also gives the example of, um, of uh, someone um, uh, felling a tree. Uh, and he, he it's a beautiful uh, way of, of kind of summarizing his thoughts. He says, thinking there happens in the tree, in the ax, in the hand, in the way in which the body responds to the tree and to the, to the, the, the previous uh, strike, of course. And so kind of the, the way in which all of these individuals connect and create a new type of individual, individuality, that is actually what thinks. So for Spinoza, the relation between these individuals is in the end much more important and actually prior to the individuals themselves. So what Spinoza has to offer us, uh, the philosophy of the body of matter of Spinoza is a philosophy of relations. How does the relation allow an individual to act as one? to uh, persevere in being. That's a nice term that Spinoza often uses, uh, the persevering of being. And that can be an individual, it can, uh, a human individual, it can be kind of any kind of conglomerate of things. He also talks about democracy in that sense. Uh, Spinoza is the first one to really show how uh, democracy could, uh, modern democracy could function, uh, also uh, moving away from uh, religion uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a presence in the state. Uh, so that's his philosophical political tractatus. Um, but anyway, uh, this is a very interesting um, idea of, uh, of matter and of the body, and especially because uh, thinking here is such a, uh, uh, intrinsically connected to materiality. And that is also for me why new materialism, uh, I wrote this book, it's over here, I don't know, it's not promotional material, but this was the book that uh, Christine already referred to, uh, New Materialism, Interviews and Cartographies. Uh, we keep referring to uh, a phrase of Karen Barrett in that book, which uh, I think uh, has also become really important for, for what new materialism has become, which is that and as a new materialist, you're interested in how matter comes to matter. So we're playing with the term matter here, uh, as in it's, uh, it has to do with the materiality of things, um, but also how this materiality comes to matter. So how in the relationship kind of a new idea can come into being uh, through this particular materiality and very much in connection to this particular materiality. So those are the, the kind of the, the, the starting points for um, what I hope to do in a, in a book like this and what a philosophy of matter uh, should look like. Um, um, I continue by, um, uh, as I say in the beginning, I, I have a lot of sympathy for, for these particular fields in contemporary philosophy and for particular fields in the history of philosophy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, by focusing so much also on imagination, 
uh, I immediately say that the arts are an important influence for me and for my thinking. And I think this is something which is important for so many post-humanists and new materialist thinkers and affect theorists. So this is also why I think that this notion of imagination is a much more interesting idea of thinking than, um, for instance, rational thought. Which also means that um, uh, I, uh, I, I use a lot of um, novelists, for instance. Michel Serre has often said that uh, the difference between fiction writing and non-fiction writing or academic writing is a recent invention of academia and we should get rid of it. Um, books are books and books work with the idea of imagination and um, we should make use of all different forms of books uh, and um, uh, in our thinking in in our ways of doing philosophy. I completely agree with him there. Uh, to do that um, in this part, I I take a perspective, um, and I learned a lot from. Uh, well, I mentioned already the and Guattari and Michel Serre in that sense, but also Donna Haraway when she talks uh, of situated knowledges. In situated knowledges, she warns us for what she calls the God trick, which means that in science and in philosophy and in so many um, uh, fields of thought, we tend to take a very abstract, non-existent perspective and say something about the world. Uh, whereas it is so important for thinking and especially also for Spinoza's thinking, because we have to keep in mind this kind of material conglomerate from which an idea emerges. It's so important to, to take up a perspective. Uh, I work a lot with uh, Rosie Bradotti. I'm very fortunate to teach at the same university still. She will soon retire, unfortunately, but, uh, and uh, she's also always saying uh, that we have to find our conceptual persona. That's a term that she takes from Deleuze and Guattari. Uh, when we write, we have to um, imagine a perspective. Uh, for her, the feminist is very important. Uh, the and Guattari uh, are very interested in the idiot. Um, and for me, actually, um, very much inspired also by a text by Michel Serre, it would be the geometer. So the geometer is a important figure of thought for me. And why is that? So, as said, Michel Serre writes a lot about it. He says the, the geometer is actually the first philosopher and the first politician and the first one to measure the earth. So the first one to, to understand something about what happens on the earth. Uh, he writes about um, ancient Egypt, the god Maat. And there was, when the Nile flooded, there was always this figure who pray to the god of Maat, and we can call it a priest too, who uh, had a rope. You, we can see a, a picture here of, of how that worked. The harpa donatai was the Egyptian term, by the way. Uh, you see a, uh, someone carrying a piece of rope. I'm pointing at it, which makes no sense, Rick. And there's a, there's a picture on the screen you can see. <laughs> it's carrying a piece of rope. Um, this piece of rope was used to measure the earth when the when the Nile River was flooded. the The complete village was uh, was flooded, so there was no way that you could find out where what was. Uh, so the the Harpedonitai uh, had to kind of reinvent the village. So it had to negotiate with the villagers, but also had to look at what the earth looked like. So because there was a new earth. Uh, it was flooded, was completely flooded, so you had to find out where were the trees and how can we situate the village and where should we do agriculture and where should we locate everything. Uh, so Michel Serre says that the Harp Donatai was the, was the first philosopher because, and the, the first geo-philosopher actually, because he had to kind of practice philosophy in relation to the earth and in relation to reinventing society. So it's a very, very interesting figure. 
after Deleuze died, Michel Serre gave an interview also in which he said that he and Deleuze were best friends at the end of their lives because in the end they found out after working a whole life in philosophy, doing a lot of history of philosophy, in the end they found out that they were not historians but they were geographers. That's what the Michel Serre said. So he felt very much connected to the idea of the geometer. And you can also see that in the last works of Gilles Deleuze, he actually writes a lot about the earth and about a geo philosophy. In one interview, he even said that he wanted to write a whole book on geo philosophy, but uh, he was too ill already. So that, that didn't work in the end. But this idea of geo philosophy, I think is very important, especially nowadays, it's become only more important. And it gives us a nice uh, way of, um, of doing a philosophy of matter from a very, uh, from a situated perspective. Um, so that's why I think that this figure of the geometer is, is important and is, uh, can be helpful for us. And so we're not historians, we're geometers. We're trying to understand the earth, the relations that we build with the earth and how we can, uh, can change that. So <laughs> that's what I try to summarize a bit in that sentence here. Uh, Geophilosophy starts after the flood retreats. I like that idea. Uh, especially also the connection between the, the land and the sea and, and the, the new land that is being created. And when the water and the land mix and become fertile and a new time, this is a term from Herodotus, a new time announces itself. So yeah, that's, those are uh, interesting terms for me. This is the wrong button, Rick. One of the books that I find really uh, inspiring, um, again, uh, Michel Tournier, the, the author, was also a, a good friend uh, of Gilles Deleuze, actually. Um, Deleuze referred to the book in his book, in his book Logic of Sense. But actually, uh, at that time, the book Friday was published at the end of the 1960s. It was popular throughout uh, Europe and, and the Americas, actually. So the book Friday is a Robinsonade, which means that it is a rewriting of, uh, of the idea of, uh, of Defoe, um, in, which, uh, uh, in which you imagine a new type of Robinson. And Michel Tournay uh, does this with, with an enormous amount of uh, cleverness. Uh, so not like uh, the original Robinson, who's actually very, it's actually quite a boring book. Uh, but uh, in Tournier, uh, especially the, the, the island, eh, Speranza, becomes very important. Um, if you read the book, which I, I recommend this to you, of course, uh, you will see that in the beginning of the book, when Robinson arrives at the island, he does what he thinks is right to do. Uh, which means that he practices his religion and he practices capitalism. He, and he's extremely successful, by the way, an enormous uh, uh, harvest. And um, so enough to eat. Uh, he builds a beautiful house uh, and he practices his religion. But, but he finds out as he lives there that this is not the life of the island. This is a very important and interesting idea. It's not the life of the island. So he feels that this is not something that can be really established here. It's him colonializing the island. Whereas he finds out in what well, the Leuze calls this a world without others. So a world in which you are not kind of uh, kept in the social narrative that is uh, often so important in our decision making. Uh, when that changes, um, you see that um, he, he finds an, an, it's a, this is a beautiful passage in the book. Uh, Robinson then all of a sudden finds out there's there's another island there. Eh? And this is what it says in the, in the quote. There was a radiance in the air and in a moment of inexpressible happiness, Robinson seemed to discern another island behind the one he had labored so long in solitude. A place more alive, warmer and more fraternal, which his mundane preoccupations had concealed for him. Yeah, uh, as said, Deleuze also refers to this in the, one of the appendixes of, uh, of Logic of Sense. 
and especially this idea of anotherness becomes for the Leuze important. For me, it's really kind of uh, uh, how how Michel Tournier shows us that uh, our our thinking, uh, the kind of uh, the narratives that 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 we are captured in um, are so powerful that they uh, kind of hide the earth from us. And in order to establish a new relationship with the earth, it is important to acknowledge that and to search for ways to build new relationships. Uh, so doing a geo philosophy, um, according to the geometer's perspective, I, I would say that hey, we have to to kind of uh, uncover this this earth, which is already there, but which we uh, cannot see. Um, so I uh, think that's uh, why this novel really helped me. Um, so in the third part, uh, I try to... Um, um, to practice a geo philosophy, uh, and then of course um, I have to come up with some concepts that are important for me, uh, as I uh, hope to understand uh, how we can do this geo philosophy. And a few concepts that uh, I already promised to 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 highlight a bit. Um, which um, yeah, which are very important to to, uh, to to the book are the concepts of cracks and wounds, which are more or less the same things. Um, and this is not a negative concept, by the way, uh, as you can see that also with um, Deleuze and with uh, Michel Serre, but also with the Haraway and with Braidotti and with all the other people that I, I sympathize with. Um, the kind of philosophy that we promote here is a very affirmative philosophy, which means that um, even when we talk about cracks and wounds, these are not terms that uh, that should be interpreted negatively. In the end, a crack and a wound, uh, when it comes to the philosophy of matter, I would say are opportunities to... Uh, um, uh, to redevelop life, to redevelop things, and to make things better. Um, it's just that, uh, so it's not, uh, this would be a more Cartesian or modern perspective that the world is ideal and a crack or a wound uh, kind of destroys uh, the ideal world, which is also, for instance, the way in which uh, uh, people who are interested in the, in the preservation of nature talk about the concept of nature as if nature is perfect and as if we human beings have cracked it. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I think the cracks have always been there and the wounds have always been there. It's just up to us to find ways to deal with it. I think that is really crucial for understanding uh, the earth, eh? for understanding what the what the geometer intends to do so move away from uh, idealism in that sense and situate yourself and understand the the difficulties staying with the troubles as uh, as donna haraway calls it these days so for me and now i read what i put on the screen uh, it's apart from the book uh, the cracks are not so much in time as they happen with the time i see them in in the contemporary, the cracks that disturb the religious, humanist, and capitalist realities of today, and that keep on disturbing these realities, uh, as indeed uh, this form of time knows no presence. The cracks keep on playing with the presence. Again, the present is really kind of this uh, Cartesian <clears throat> idea of uh, the Cartesian narrative, which keeps steering our thoughts, which keeps steering the thoughts of Robinson, for instance, in the book from uh, Tournier, uh, but which also keeps steering the thoughts of so many of us in our everyday lives, as we are modernists uh, in, in so many ways. And uh, uh, it's our kind of hope that, um, uh, that in the philosophy of matter, you, 
you practice that differently. Um, uh, another author, which has also been, uh, there's nowadays a bit of critique on, on him, and I completely disagree with that, by the way. Uh, I think he's a wonderful contemporary author and he, written, he has written beautiful books. His uh, name is uh, Haruki Murakami, contemporary Japanese author. Uh, this is a quote which I absolutely love uh, from one of his not so well-known books. Really talks about cracks and, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, wounds. One heart is not connected to another through harmony alone. They are instead linked deeply through their wounds. Pain linked to pain, fragility to fragility. There is no silence without a cry of grief, nor forgiveness without bloodshed. No acceptance without a passage through acute loss. That is what lies at the root of true harmony. I think it's a beautiful idea. Um, the woundedness and the fact that uh, I start that chapter also by saying that every heart is broken, which is not a negative thing. That's the case and we have to deal with it. And uh, I like the way in which Murakami in many of his books searches for um, ways to deal with it. Uh, for instance, in this book, uh, call it under, uh, uh, yeah, you see the title. Um, the the uh, the main character keeps saying that the wounds that he had during his childhood have not healed so the idea of healing is also i would say a very modernist idea every wound needs to be healed why i mean it's more much more important that you deal with it and that is actually what murakami also shows that throughout the book you have to find have you you have to build a life on the wound in that sense and uh, I think that is a, a very important lesson. So another author that I find extremely interesting in that sense um, is, um, and this is not, um, I, I write something about it in this book, but also in a book that is uh, about to be published. Um, it's um, on a book on Deleuze and Guattering and Fascism. I write about uh, Jouet Bousquet, uh, as said, it's also in, in this one, uh, so, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I really think it's a, an interesting uh, author. Uh, I'm talking now about Joe Bousquet, uh, and he needs uh, much more attention. Joe Bousquet, you see a picture of him, although I uh, made it a bit too creative here, but you see a, a small fragment of Joe Bousquet still in his room. Joe Bousquet was a... Um, soldier in the First World War, uh, and he was um, very, um, how would you describe that? Uh, he was um, a very uh, brave and a bit too brave and uh, sometimes reckless soldier. And he was, uh, actually there were stories that he was wearing red boots um just to attract the attention of the germans so he was he was at the french side of things he was wearing red boots just kind of like uh, i can deal with things <laughs> um but that didn't really work out well uh, he got shot uh, actually he got a bullet in his spine which meant that he was um he was uh, unable to move for the rest of his life you see him here lying in his bed in his room uh, in Carcassonne, and that is actually where he stayed all the time uh, since uh, his uh, 21st uh, year. So he spent uh, 40 years in that room. Uh, the windows closed, no light, uh, and he read and he wrote a lot. He became a poet and he became a very important poet actually. Um, this was really, um, he became a center of, of, of surrealist, um, the surrealist movement in France. So all of the big painters in surrealism, not only in France, actually also the German ones, uh, came in the end to Jouet Bousquet, to his room, uh, to talk and to discuss and to think about what was important. And he published a lot of poetry and in the end also a lot of um, 
letters and a few novels. Quite a famous uh, figure. Deleuze uh, refers to Jouet Bousquet at the beginning of his career and in the very last, uh, in the very last article that he publishes. And especially, uh, Deleuze is interested in how Jouet Bousquet talks of his wound. As said, Jouet Bousquet was wounded. I mean, he was paralyzed completely from the, uh, from, um, from the top of his body. Um, but he never took that as a limitation. Uh, he actually said that his woundedness was what gave him, uh, Deleuze called this, his non-carnal birth. Um, and there are a few quotes of Jouet Bousquet that Deleuze refers to and that uh, kind of summarize also um, the thinking of Jouet Bousquet. Uh, I mean, not only Deleuze wrote about him, I will soon come also with uh, Alquier, which was actually the teacher of Deleuze, uh, who met, who knew him personally. And so many other French philosophers so work with Jouet Bousquet. Uh, but anyway, these, these quotes are fantastic and they summarize what, uh, what woundedness is all about. The first one is the most famous, and my wounds existed before me, I was born to embody them. So that is, that is the story of Jouet Bousquet and the way in which he kind of invented his life, he, he created his life. Uh, consequential to his wounds, um, a beautiful life in which he wrote fantastic novels uh, and uh, and poetry. I mean, even only a sentence like this is more than enough, I would say, for a lifetime. Uh, uh, he wrote a lot with uh, Simone Weil and with um, uh, actually the whole of uh, French academia. Uh, they all knew Jouet Bousquet. Um, and he said, have become the person of your misfortunes, learn to embody their perfection and brilliance. And also the third one, hey, live your wounds beautifully. Uh, for me, that is a very um, interesting way of, a very materialist way also of thinking, yeah, to learn to think with wounds. Wounds are also kind of, it's, it's a kind of emptiness. It's a kind of nothingness. It's full of promises because anything can happen. Uh, wounds in that sense are also not, this is also what I stress in the book, they're not personal because they they come with a whole kind of, uh, and they're linked to so many other histories. In, in Busquets' uh, history, it's all too obvious that it was linked to the rise of fascism and to kind of all of the wars that Europe was, uh, was struggling with for so long, for centuries. Um, so the kind of woundedness is uh, is is really uh, uh, a geo philosophy in in that sense because it's not it's not a personal philosophy it's not an, it's not I think therefore I am it is really about uh, situating oneself uh, with all of one's failures and all of the difficulties of societies and uh, staying with the trouble again and searching for ways to make it productive to to see how we can work with it anyway to live them beautifully live these wounds beautifully uh, so those are important terms uh, for me um, this is a quote from uh, Ferdinand Alquier as said he was the professor uh, one of the supervisors of Deleuze actually uh, but he himself wrote a fantastic book on the philosophy of surrealism uh, Alquier grew up in Carcassonne, so he knew uh, Jouet Bousquet personally. He visited there as a young man, but they stayed in contact throughout his life. And uh, very important for um, actually the, the way in which French thought developed um, before Deleuze. I mean, it was not just uh, Sartre and de Beauvoir. I mean, there was a whole generation of important thinkers who all went through the first world war and the second world war and and this is uh, a, a, a thinker that also needs more attention in that sense Ferdinand Alquier. so he wrote a lot about surrealism also linking the arts to philosophy which i said 
already is very important to me. And uh, he also, um, uh, he took um, Jouet Bousquet as the, as the key example of surrealism because Jouet Bousquet for him kind of embodies literally uh, the way in which surrealism tried to deal with the wounds of fascism and with all the rubbish that was going on in that uh, in those days. Okay. So I try to summarize it with this quote uh, from Altier: "To liberate man was always the aim of surrealism. It was not just. And this is why. Please forget Dali if you talk about surrealism. That's that has nothing to do with. Uh, it's the opposite actually." To liberate man was always the aim of surrealism. It is necessary to add that with Nazism menacing in the midst of an oppressed France, the problem of man's liberation could not be resolved by automatic writing. We were more like Dada and uh, those uh, kind of movements. But in, in a manner more precise, urgent and pointed by taking a political position and by a call to arms. So very interesting reading of what surrealism does. So it's not just thinking of uh, uh, awkward uh, banded clocks and uh, elephants with uh, extremely long legs. I'm talking about uh, paintings from uh, Dali now, uh, but it really has to do with uh, uh, rethinking society, rethinking the earth, rethinking oneself, very much from a situated perspective and from, from the, uh, from the troubles of the times. Uh, so, yeah. The last part of the book, I try to link this a bit to the different um, uh, movements in academia nowadays. So I talk about feminism, but also about the arts, of course. Uh, so about architecture and dance. Um, I have to look up at the time a bit. Um, I will take a few more minutes, I think, uh, is allowed. I see Christina nodding, so uh, it must be okay. Uh, I start with uh, um, a bit of Michel Serre, who, um, who also emphasizes what I think is important. Huh? And I call this geometer, show me a new earth. So that's why I, I come up with all these uh, comrades of mine, uh, and like uh, uh, Karen Baird and Donna Haraway, but also contemporary architects and dancers uh, who really think with the earth in that sense. <clears throat> Michel Serre has always done that. Um, he always comes up with the example of the Garonne River. He, he himself um, was born in the south of France next to the Garonne River. His father collected stones for a living. So you can imagine that he was not that wealthy. In fact, they were very poor. Michel Serre was the first one to read a book in the family. And he wrote 80, ones in, 80 books in his life, actually. So he took revenge. Um, but anyway, he, he grew up next to the Garonne River. And in so many of his writings, he refers to the fact that the Garonne River is not something distant for him, even though he lived in Paris for most of his life. And he said that uh, the Garonne River uh, is an inevitable companion, a sister, a mother, a friend that is not far away from where he lived right now. So I like that idea. And I think that is really how we take, <clears throat> how we take our... Uh, materiality with us uh, when we write and when we think and when we create, when we imagine. Uh, so that for me is a nice starting point. <clears throat> so I um, I use um, as said I, I I write about feminism, but um, because I don't have too much time and also because I want to introduce the arts a bit more, I will now just focus on architecture and dance uh, because I have also written quite a lot about feminism already. Um, and it's important also to uh, stress that uh, the same things are happening in, in architecture, in dance and in the arts uh, in that sense. Eh? So as said, I want to emphasize imagination. So um, for me, that's important. Um, uh, in architecture, I I, I make reference to uh, to um, well the works of uh, 
Lars Pijbroek mainly, and uh, the way he rereads the history of architecture, uh, also critiquing modernism, which he refers to as a kind of a fascist movement even. So modernism in architecture, we're talking about Bauhaus, but the ideal of the white cube, or everything in architecture in the end had to result in a white cube for a while, as we all remember. Um, um, Lars Pijbroek, a very contemporary architecture, if you see his designs, uh, he's now mainly writing, but especially in the 1990s and the 2000s, he made these beautiful, um, if, if, well, if you, I should have included pictures of that, uh, but um, if you see his, his work, it's, um, it's very, you would describe it as very modern, but he would not use that term, uh, very contemporary is better maybe. Uh, but anyway, he rewrites the history of architecture also in saying that uh, 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 as contemporary architects, we should move away from the white cube and we should understand the ornament again. Uh, and we should understand that the ornament is not just something extra which you add to a building, but it is really part of it. And that is why he says we should move away from what in architecture is called Roman architecture. And move away much and move much more to the gothic where there's no difference between uh, the ceiling and a wall and, uh, con and a construction and an ornament uh, which again fits the, the more relationist and the more relational uh, type of uh, spinozist thinking that I, that I work with from the beginning of this book so thinking uh, architecture as not so much uh, um, a series of elements which together make a building, but really on how relationality creates a new type of space. I think that is what uh, Spybrook is after and what he sees also uh, in the work of William Morris. And uh, I have a, a painting here. Uh, this is the dome of the baptistry of um, the, uh, in Florence, um, of the dome in Florence. <clears throat> and you see here, um, this is Giotto and uh, especially G Cimabue was the first kind of uh, uh, Renaissance uh, painter. And he used all kinds of optical um, illusions to, to, to create new senses of space. And it was not so much uh, an, uh, it was not so much an ornament as in something extras, but it really created an experience of space and an experience of openness, of course, also a religious experience. So uh, in that sense, this really is the kind of undercurrent. I come back to the terms that I used from the beginning of this book, an undercurrent in thought. It's, it's, it's this kind of thinking, this different way of, of thinking has been there all along. And uh, I think uh, Spiebel gives us a good, uh, rewriting of the history of architecture so not uh, traditionalist buildings and then there was modernism in which everything was better uh, but really also very much in how Deleuze actually rewrites the history of painting um, saying that uh, figurative, pa figurative painting can be much more revolutionary than the white cube in that sense it's really about rethinking a notion of space, rethinking a notion of situatedness, which happens in art, uh, imagining a different kind of situation. So that also uh, happens, I would say, in, in the work of Sima Boe, as it works in contemporary um, uh, architecture, um, much more than what is, what is considered to be modernism which is uh, still, I mean, that's what you learn still at architecture uh, education, still loyal to what they call the Cartesian line. As again, René Descartes, it's very much kind of making a mm, geometric figure of reality and uh, reducing reality to a geometric figure. Okay. Uh, I said that dancing in that sense, uh, uh, choreography, performative arts uh, are also of importance. I, I use this line from uh, William Forsyth. Uh, he has a dancing company in, in Frankfurt still. I don't know if he's too, too active in it at the moment, but uh, he done some beautiful choreographies uh, 
and he had this quote, Brian Masumi also worked with it. Uh, it was in a personal conversation that he also used it. Uh, he said, uh, William Forsyth, choreographer, uh, says uh, a body uh, gives it gives a very nice definition. A body is that which folds, which really kind of uh, moves us, kind of moves away from the whole, uh, again, Cartesian or modernist idea of the individual as a kind of a, a human essentialism. Uh, and it's such a nice thought that in contemporary dance, you can see this happening. You can see that um, starting with Pina Bausch, the, the chair is not an addition. It's not an ornament that you put on a stage and you do your dance there. You do your ballet and you jump as high as you can or you make some twirls. No, you, you rediscover your body and the body of the chair uh, at the same time in that relationality. So that is kind of, the way in which you see that contemporary dance really breaks away from this tradition uh, in <clears throat> what I would call modern dance, where you still have the human body as an ideal and uh, uh, you explore the possibilities of the human body, which means jumping high and making twists and whatever. Um, I would say that contemporary dance uh, it starts with Pina Bausch and with any, and everything that, that followed from it is a much more interesting and relational way of thinking at work. It's much more situational. It's much more kind of exploring the possibilities of what can be done in terms of the body and the mind. I would say that it also makes us think differently about our environment and about what we do uh, with the world around us. And this quote from, from William Forsythe in that sense, I read it as a very Spinozist idea. A body is that which falls it really. I mean, it, he doesn't say it's a human body. Uh, he, he said they had the only way, what defines a body is the foldedness, which actually means the way in which it functions as one, which is how I started my talk saying that in, when Spinoza talks about individuality, it's, it's about the cooperation. It is how you work together. It's about democracy. It can also be me and the computer. It can be all kinds of cooperations. So that's what a choreographer like William Forsythe is also interested in, in how that can work. <clears throat> so that is more or less um, what, um, what the book is about and what I think is important when it comes to a philosophy of matter. Uh, I end with uh, again, the, the, the geometer as a figure of thought, uh, figure to um, uh, which which kind of allows us to imagine the world otherwise, um, and um, um, to show us that through imagination, uh, through philosophy and the arts, which I really see as one movement, um, we can. Um, think also about contemporary issues differently. I gave the example of, uh, uh, of nature uh, activism, but uh, of course there are many other ways of, uh, of seeing this type of thinking at work. That's not really what I saw as, a, as, a, as a, something which I had to do in this book. I mean, the whole idea was to, to write a philosophy of matter. So. And this is where I leave it uh, in that sense. And this is also where I think I should stop because I talked for at least 45 minutes, maybe a bit longer already. <clears throat> Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, 